Well, um, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar today where we'll go for about uh, an hour and a half. This webinar is on integrated design, radical energy efficiency, and it will be presented by Mr. Amory Lovins from the Rocky Mountain Institute. But for those of you who are new to A2EP, let me give you a quick introduction about what we do. Um, so A2EP is an independent, non-partisan, non-for-profit coalition of business, government and research leaders promoting a more energy productive economy. Uh, we're leading a drive to double energy productivity in Australia. And our innovation program is accelerating the uh, uptake of technology, which has transformative change. And uh, we ensure that roadmaps and reports become reality. And we're doing that right now with ARENA. Uh, we're working on a process heating study, uh, which will go through to several new applications of um, heat, industrial heat pumps, solar thermal heating uh, that will become implemented over the next year or so. Just yesterday, we hosted a, a discussion with Australia's chief scientist, uh, Dr. Alan Finkel, and he took us through the uh, government's technology investment roadmap and the priorities uh, therein and we're very happy to see energy productivity uh, technologies uh, making up a, a very large percentage of those uh, breakthrough technologies for reducing emissions in Australia. However, energy productivity should not be seen as just a series of one-off standalone technologies. It needs to be seen uh, in, in an overall sense uh, when you're de designing and developing projects. Uh, which is why we're here today talking about integrated design. It must be done at the beginning of the project uh, because to do it later is, uh, is either impossible or often too expensive. So that's why it's great to have uh, designers and the like join us today to talk about this. So today we have a one hour presentation and then uh, followed by about 30 minutes of Q&A. And you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A uh, uh, button. So if you press on that one, you'll open up a box where you can type in your questions. Uh, so it, once you open that chat box or the question box, uh, you'll be able to type them in and you'll see there's a little thumbs up there. And if you upvote uh, questions that you like, uh, we'll make sure they're asked first at the end of the, the session today. So look out for, for that one and, and hit those upvotes. So to Amory, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you Amory Lovins. Amory is the Chairman and Chief Scientist of the Rocky Mountain Institute in, from Colorado. Uh, the RMI was uh, established in 1982 to do research, publication and consulting on sustainability. And it's grown to be one of the, uh, the largest and most respected uh, uh, consulting organisations on sustainability around the world. Uh, Amory must be considered as one of the most respected futurists in the scientific world and it's, it's no surprise that he was named by Time magazine as one of the world's most influential people in 2009. Uh, Amory has coined such terms as the negawatt uh, related to a unit of energy saved and, and we heard that just yesterday from Dr. Alan Finkel. Uh, his words were a kilowatt of energy saved is the best energy generation technique there is. Uh, Amory's also uh, coined the term hypercar uh, relating to lightweight, ultra-efficient cars. And I must say, if you're a Ford or a GM executive and you went back to uh, around 2010 and you looked at a few of Amory's TED Talks around then, uh, and, and you must be kicking yourself that you did not follow that script of his exactly. Uh, apparently, Elon Musk may have, and Tesla did, and uh, we're seeing the results of that one today. So uh, let's let's hear from a doyen of our industry, and remember, if you have any questions, type them in that question box, um, and, and don't forget to upvote questions that you like, and we'll take those at the end. Otherwise, Amory, uh, absolute pleasure, pleasure to introduce to you, uh, and uh, over to you. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I wish I could see you on the other end, but it's nice to be able to ship the electrons and leave the heavy nuclei at home here in the passive solar banana farm in Colorado. Uh, I'm particularly glad to have this opportunity to remind you about how to design whole systems for radical efficiency in using energy, and for that matter, water, metals, any kind of resource. 
The practice I'll describe uh, or summarize at least applies orthodox engineering principles, but it asks different design questions in a different order and therefore gets very different answers. I recently presented this material as a six day intensive course and, and my team is developing various other tools to help turn this approach from rare to common. I'd certainly welcome uh, your advice and help in spreading this news if you find it of value. Now, I will not be talking today about energy supply. Uh, modern renewables now provide two thirds of the world's net additions of electric capacity that started in 2017 and still going. Uh, and it's thanks to their powerful business case. Our bigger challenge is capturing modern megawatts, a term I didn't coin, I just discovered it as a typo and spread it around. Saved energy is already the world's biggest energy source. Just the energy saved worldwide since 1990 now supports more energy services than oil does. And roughly two thirds of those savings come from smarter technologies and practices, one third from structural change and a little behavioral change. For example, if the United States total primary energy demand had kept growing in lockstep with GDP since 1975, Americans would have used that much energy, but instead they cut that use by more than half, saving cumulative energy equivalent to 25 years of current use. Meanwhile, the renewable energy output doubled, but that had 28 times less cumulative impact than the savings. Renewables get virtually all the headlines because they're visible whilst energy is invisible and the energy you don't use is almost unimaginable. Yet from 2010 to 16, according to the International Energy Agency, the world saved energy avoided three times as much carbon emissions as all the growth in renewable and nuclear energy production. Around 1975, the United States government and industry all said that the energy needed to make a dollar of GDP could never drop. A year later, I heretically suggested it could drop 72% in 50 years. So far, it's dropped 59% in 44 years. Yet, just the innovations already added by 2010 can save another threefold, twice what I originally thought, and a third the real cost. And today that looks conservative because integrative design, that is optimizing buildings, vehicles, factories, and equipment as whole systems, not as piles of parts, can often make very big energy savings cost less than small or no savings, turning diminishing returns into increasing returns. Professor Allwood's group at Cambridge University says global energy use in 2005 was only about a ninth as efficient as physics allows. That is second law efficiency averaged about 11% versus about 14 in the United States. So including passive options as well, they said 85% of energy demand could be practically avoided using current knowledge and available technologies. Now, I think that's a bit conservative, but whatever the right number is, integrative design gets us closer, cheaper, as I'll illustrate with diverse examples that start in a number of sectors to set up concepts that I'll then elaborate. Now, economic geologists know that a mineral's reserves that is the identified deposits profitably extractable with current technology and price are only a small part of the whole resource base. Most energy analysts also narrowly define reserves of energy efficiency, like the bright green zone in these mineral resource definitions. But the actual energy efficiency reserves are several fold larger than are now typically recognized and captured. And the missing majority is hiding in plain view exploitable by integrative design. This geological analogy is correct on quantity, but it, it really breaks down on cost because ore bodies are finite assemblages of concentrated atoms, whilst energy efficiency resources are infinitely expandable assemblages of ideas that deplete nothing but stupidity, a, a very abundant, if not expanding resource. 
That's documented in a peer-reviewed paper called How Big is the Energy Efficiency Resource? Uh, you can find it by searching on that title. It's free and it has a nice four-minute video abstract. Its evidence across all sectors shows that unlike oil or copper, most new energy efficiency reserves actually cost less than the current savings because they come not from adding more or fancier devices, but from using fewer and simpler devices, more artfully chosen, combined, timed, and sequenced. Before explaining how we do this magic, let me start you off with a little mental calisthenic, if I may. One of my early mentors, the inventor Edwin Land said, don't undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. He also said, people who seem to have had a new idea have often just stopped having an old idea. That's the hard part. An Asian tradition similarly urges us to seek original mind, beginner's mind, child mind, opening ourselves to new ideas by shedding all assumptions and preconceptions. So in that spirit, here's an example from Caltech's late great aerodynamicist, Paul McCready. For decades, textbooks on creative thinking have posed this problem as find the solution that connects these nine dots with just four lines without lifting your pen from the paper. So you're supposed to try, let's see, one, two, three, four. Oops, that doesn't work. One, two, that doesn't go to work. And of course, what you're supposed to do is think outside the box, which is where that expression comes from. But one day, a student startled her professor by saying she'd solved this problem with just three lines. Gee, four was hard enough. How do you do it with three? Dots are infinitely small. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. These are actually rather plump dots. And you don't actually have to go through the center of them. Huh. So if your paper is wide enough, you can do this trick. Z for Zorro. And the students, of course, then started to feel rather liberated. You know what happens then. They started to solve this problem with just one line. Here are a few of their many solutions. Uh, if you're Japanese, you might think first of the origami solution, where you just fold up the paper until all the points come together in a line. Or if you're, let's say, a geographer, you might use a very long line. Or if you're a mechanical engineer, a tool using critter, you might take a tool called a scissors to cut out the dots and impale them on the pencil. Or if you're a statistician, you could crumple up the paper and if you stab it over and over again enough times with the pencil, eventually you'll go through online dots at the same instant. And the solution I like best came from a nine-year-old girl who said, you didn't say it had to be a thin line, so I used a really thick line. So as McCready said, this tyranny of the word the, find the solution with four lines, put us back in the box and kept us from being more creative and finding more elegantly frugal solutions. So with beginner's mind, never having built a house before and therefore not knowing what was impossible, 38 years ago, I did the conceptual and energy design of the owner builder house I'm speaking to you from. Uh, where Judy and I live. It's 2,200 meters up in the mountains near Aspen, Colorado, where temperatures used to dip as low as minus 44 Celsius with up to 39 days of continuous midwinter cloud. We had snow here about a week ago. Uh, remember, our seasons are upside down, so that's mid-June. Uh, we've had frost on the 4th of July, and we have no heating system. Now, omitting the heating system <clears throat> subtracted slightly more construction cost than we added for the super insulation, super windows, and ventilation heat recovery that eliminated the heating system. This house helped inspire the German and then European passive house movement, hundreds of thousands of copies now. And the central atrium behind me, uh, seen uh, here in a February snowstorm, uh, has produced so far 77 passive solar banana crops. Someone said I had really big earphones. So an analogous approach also turns out to work just fine in Bangkok. And nearly everyone on earth lives in climates somewhere between Bangkok's and mine. 
Integrative design gives you many benefits from each expenditure. So the white arch behind me, uh, as you can see also in the uh, top center photo at the top, it has 12 different functions, but it has only one cost. Now, our integrative design to retrofit the Empire State Building in New York saved 38%, now it's 40% of its energy with a three-year payback. Three years later, our cost-effective Denver retrofit saved 70%, making this difficult half-century-old government complex more efficient than what was then the best United States office at NREL, which in turn is less than half as efficient as Rocky Mountain Institute's passive net positive, no mechanicals office 10 minutes from here. That uses a sixth the normal energy of the, in the, in the coldest, uh, oh my, North American climate zone. Actually it uses an eighth as much because we've, in last year's commissioning, we reduced that number from 51 to 36 kilowatt hours per square meter a year. I need to fix that. Uh, <clears throat> And now there's a Bavarian building using two-fifths less energy than ours. And yet these technologies all existed more than a decade ago. What mainly improved doubling the best efficiencies in five years is not so much the technology as design, the way we choose and combine technologies. Let me dive a bit into a simple example. 26 years ago, this ordinarily ugly 155 square meter experimental new house was built in central California. A hot day there reaches 40 Celsius and the maximum is 46. And yet this house achieved superior comfort with no air conditioner and it would cost less than normal both to build and maintain if built in a mature market rather than as a one-off experiment. How did the designers do this? Well first they improved the layout to eliminate seven meters of superfluous perimeter. They put the windows in the right places. They devised an oriented strandboard wall that saved three fourths of the wood, doubled the insulating value, improved strength, air tightness, durability, stability, speed of construction, and it cost 2000 US dollars less to build. And together these improvements cut the site energy use to 15% less than what was then the strictest US standard and it saved $4,000 of construction cost. Then the designers improved the lights, appliances, glazings, hot water system, and raised the total savings to about 60%. That eliminated the furnace, which they replaced with a radiant coil in the floor slab, fed by the then 94% efficient gas water heater that they were paying for anyway. But they still needed four of the original 12 thermal kilowatts of space cooling and they were up to their cost effectiveness ceiling. Happily though, they had reserved in a special potential cooling elimination basket, all the proposed improvements that didn't save enough energy to pay for themselves, but that did cut cooling load. And together, seven such measures more than eliminated the remaining air conditioner and its ducts, wires, and controls, saving another 1,500 US dollars of capital cost. So altogether, they then had a total net saving of mature market construction cost uh, of about uh, 1800 US dollars uh, and the energy savings for space and water heating, space cooling, refrigeration and lighting were about 80%. They simply optimized the whole house as a system, not any single component by itself. And by the way, the present valued maintenance costs would also go down by about 1600 US dollars. I mentioned the Empire State Building retrofit. And there we started by remanufacturing in a little improvised window factory on a vacant floor, all six and a half thousand windows into super windows that pass light but block heat, insulate about four times better than double glazing, plus better lights and office equipment and so on. And all that cut the maximum cooling load by a third. But then renovating smaller chillers rather than adding bigger chillers saved 17 million US dollars of capex, paying for most of the other improvements and cutting the payback to three years or less than one year had we counted the non-energy benefits to the owner or the tenants. 
By the way, a major energy service company had also offered a three-year payback with disintegrated design, yielding only one-sixth the savings that we got. Similarly, in six uh, very humid Indian cities, one and a half million square meters of offices integratively designed by Rohan Parikh's team for emphasis use up to 80% less energy than the Indian norm with 10 to 20% lower construction cost, 60% less cooling capacity and yet superior comfort and satisfaction. You'll notice on the right, glare-free daylighting delivered throughout this big floor plate by contract. If workers complain of glare and demand blinds, the architect doesn't get paid. Now this chart, <clears throat> a bit of an eye chart I'm afraid, summarizes the technical efficiency benchmarks I pay the most attention to for big new office buildings in three efficiency categories. Normal, that is rather poor. It's typical of over 90% of the US and I dare they say the Australian stock. And then better and the best we could document over the past decade for measured values. The white data are US, blue are Japan, green is the uh, Rocky Mountain Institute office in Western Colorado that you saw earlier, and red is uh, the best we could find in India. Now, comparing the left with the far right numerical column, you can see that the best U.S. practice cuts the total and electrical needs, the top two lines, by about five to tenfold. The as-used lighting power density net of controls and dimming uh, by about five to 24 fold, the plug loads by even more, the glazings improve by an order of magnitude and <clears throat> they become almost perfectly selective here in sorting out light from heat. Add super insulation not shown and a heat rejecting roof and you need three to five times less cooling. And then you can make the cooling system about four to 13 times more efficient than normal big building practice with water-cooled centrifugals. You can also use the space in the building uh, about one to six percentage points more efficiently. Anyway, whatever exists is possible. Now industrializing mass retrofits to net zero standard and streamlining their finance and soft costs is now getting cheap enough in say multifamily housing like this to finance entirely from saved energy whilst extending building life and improving amenity health and value. The whole retrofit package in this Dutch energy strong uh, method adding a kind of pre-built tea cozy around your house has even been demonstrated in Britain to be installable in a single day whilst you're off at work. So Rocky Mountain Institute is striving to spread this European approach to the United States and since the cost of the Dutch projects includes a new kitchen and bathroom to sweeten the deal, it seems likely that these ambitious energy savings are already paying for themselves without needing subsidy. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported six years ago that for diverse building types and climates, the best European new builds of various types and climates on the left and retrofits on the right uh, both with bigger energy savings towards the right, are saving up to at least 90% without raising the cost per unit of saved energy. The better projects are all highly cost effective and the big vertical cost scatter shows the business opportunity to conform in inferior projects to best practices. No doubt econometricians would expect to fit this to a curve of rising costs, that's a mistake because again, whatever exists is possible. So pay attention to the, uh, the points that are down near the horizontal axis. That shows best practice. Now, thinking that energy efficient design is about choosing and installing energy efficient equipment is like supposing that if you simply toss good ingredients in a pot and heat it, you'll get a tasty dish. But actually efficient systems like good cooking result from whole system design. Even the finest ingredients will not make a great meal unless you use a good recipe and a skilled chef to combine the right ingredients in the right 
sequence and manner and proportions. So let's dig a little into how in design as in cooking, it's vital to do the right things in the right order. For example, most lighting retrofitters start by installing higher efficacy sources and better controls, but the Illuminating Engineering Society's Handbook of Fundamentals rightly tells us first to improve the visual quality of the task. For example, clean the dust out of the photocopier optics. And then the geometry and cavity reflectance of the space, so you bounce the light round better. Then the lighting quality, cutting veiling reflections and discomfort glare. This typically means in practice lighting ceilings and walls, light surfaces, don't just dump light into volume. And then optimize the illuminance and then harvest and distribute natural light and only then optimize the luminaires and the controls and maintenance and training. This sequence is the opposite of what most retrofitters do. They start at the bottom and therefore they don't get the capital savings from having fewer luminaires uh, to produce the same or better visual performance and aesthetics. But this sequence done top to bottom can save an order of magnitude more energy and it looks better and you see better. Or how do you stay comfortable thermally in a hot, humid place? Hot, dry is easier. Well, let's think about the office <clears throat> that uh, Rocky Mountain Institute put up five years ago in nearby Basalt, Colorado. How did we eliminate the heating and cooling equipment? I'll focus here on cooling. <coughs> well, 30 odd years ago, I asked my hostess in Tokyo why she didn't heat her house. And she said very sensibly, why should I? Is the house cold? This reminds us that people have nervous systems and comfort sensations, but buildings don't. So we should keep people comfortable, not buildings. So RMI's Innovation Center uh, delivers task comfort like task lighting. Each staff member has a hyperchair from Peter Rumsey, whose touchscreen or smartphone control delivers comfort to real-time instantaneous requirements greatly reducing the 42% to satisfied in recent Berkeley surveys of 50,000 office workers. The hyperchair has 3.6 watts of those silent computer muffin fans and a pair of seven watt electric car seat heaters all powered by a laptop battery. And, we, and this expands the range of indoor dry bulb air temperatures to maintain ASHRAE comfort uh, to a range from under 18 Celsius to about 30. Uh, and we exploited all six classical comfort variables from excellent ceiling fans that gain five to seven Celsius of comfort range uh, to super windows that slash the radiant loads. We rigorously reduced unwanted internal and external heat and humidity gains. We recovered 93% of the ventilation heat or cool. Like an Aspen skier dressed in a down jacket and sunglasses, the building is nearly twice as airtight as a passive house, super insulated, passively cooled by active exterior shading uh, and natural ventilation, including automated night flush to cool face change walls that amplify the thermal mass. So we didn't need such other passive <clears throat> options as ground coupling, ground water coupling, geothermal heat pipes, or a seasonal storage ice pond. We also didn't need active non-refrigerative cooling, evaporative, desiccant, absorption, adsorption, other combinations that can lead, yield over 100 units of cooling per unit of electricity. Let alone did we need refrigerative cooling, whose efficiency we can triple, I'll tell you how in a minute, nor did we need fancy storage and controls. So even in the worst climates, Bangkok, Singapore, this comprehensive approach can save around 90 to 100% of cooling energy with better comfort, lower capex, higher uptime. For example, oh, decades ago, we had a design competition to retrofit Pacific Gas and Electric's research headquarters. And I think the best design would have saved 97% of the air conditioning energy and still that left a lot on the table. If nonetheless, you do have a big water-cooled centrifugal chiller system, Here's how Dianglok in Singapore uh, trebles its efficiency with lower capex and better comfort. 
uh, you can see the, well, nowadays 1.75 standard kilowatts per ton, COP of about two, uh, two units of cooling per unit of electricity in the standard system at the Singapore Design Hour. Well, he raises that to a COP of 6.8 or 6.0 without dual chilled water temperature. So that's a 66 to 70 percent measured saving from supposedly good normal practice. Kind of costs less and works better. Notice the order of magnitude saving in the supply fan, the pumping loops, and the cooling tower by redesigning components, including pipes and ducts, more on that later, to minimize friction and optimize performance. Now, there is one trick in his system design, and that's rethinking the cooling coils. Mr. Lee's design corrects Willis Carrier's 1921 misinterpretation of his lab data. He thought that airflow through a cooling coil is turbulent and water condenses in a film, but the late Professor Sam Luxton in Adelaide actually built a wind tunnel and looked. On his right, you'll see, on the right, you'll see some of his photos proving that actually the airflow is laminar and the condensation is dropwise. So if you turn the usual deep dense coil on the upper left round sideways to make a shallow sparse coil, and then you blow the same flow of air through the same mass of copper at a quarter of the face velocity at less than one meter a second. Then you preserve those precious droplets in their extra surface area instead of smearing them out and blowing them away. That increases dehumidification 29% per unit of sensible cooling. It cuts the air side pressure drop by 95%, factor 20. So it shrinks the evaporator load and the entire cooling system. What do all these building examples teach? Well, it's about sequence. Start with the end use effect that you intend. Optimize the buildings as whole systems, not as a bunch of components. So the key to cutting construction costs is typically to use expensive glazings. In particular, pay for the efficiency largely or wholly or more through the mechanical shrinkage it causes. Cut the most capex by saving from downstream to upstream as I'll describe later. Optimize the sequence and the timing of the design steps as just illustrated for cooling and lighting. And reward the design professionals for what they save, not for what they spend. It's called performance-based design fees. Now, timing matters as well. When you're retrofitting a big glass office tower, like the one in the rear right near Chicago, where it's both very hot and humid and very cold, super windows plus efficient lights and equipment can shrink the mechanical loads and systems by fourfold, more than paying upfront for the efficiencies that shrank them. So the fourfold efficiency gain retrofitting this old Chicago office could thus pay back in about negative five months. In other words, it's cheaper than the routine 20 year renovation you have to do anyway to renovate the glazings, but that saves nothing. But to get this result, you have to coordinate that deep retrofit with the routine renewal of the curtain wall facade. Uh, deep retrofits of all our big buildings in both our countries is going to take decades, so let's right time them to make the savings much bigger and cheaper. And at retrofitdepot.org, you'll find some tools for analyzing a commercial real estate portfolio for such right timing opportunities. Similar design logic applies to automobiles. So let me give you a dozen slides on that, documented in a new SAE paper that's listed at the bottom. The propulsion system or powertrain loses four-fifths of the fuel energy in a standard car before it even gets to the wheels. But our savings should start at the wheels. Here's why. Just a fifth of the modern car's fuel energy reaches the wheels and moves the car. Of that tractive load, nearly half heats the air that the car pushes aside, and most of the rest heats the tires in the road. Uh, but only the last 6% then of the fuel energy accelerates the car and then heats the brakes when you stop. But about 19 20ths of the mass you're accelerating is the heavy steel car. So only a 20th of that 6% or about 0.3% of the fuel energy ultimately moves the driver. This is not very gratifying after one of the third centuries of devoted engineering effort. Moreover, 
both acceleration and rolling resistance depend on mass, which therefore causes most of the tractive load. Now, autobakers work hard to cut losses in the powertrain because that's where most of the losses are. There was an old American bank robber who was asked why he robbed banks. He said, oh, because that's where the money is. This is where the losses are. But reducing powertrain losses is harder than reducing tractive load because it's had so much past work already. It's also less rewarding because saving one unit of energy in the powertrain saves only one unit of fuel in the tank. But saving one unit of energy at the wheels saves another four or five units lost getting that energy to the wheels and thus leverages five or six total units of energy saved at the tank. Therefore, we should first reduce tractive load, then improve powertrain, which shrinks with the same acceleration, saving even more weight and also saving capital cost to help pay for the light weighting. How lightweight can we make an auto without compromising crash safety? Well, using ultra strong carbon fiber composites, at least 70% lighter. You know, a 787 Dreamliner is half carbon fiber composites by weight, but automaking needs about a thousand times higher volume and lower cost than aerospace. That's a big gap. But in the early 90s at the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, I met Dave Tagger, the young engineer who had led the clean sheet design of this. 95% carbon fiber advanced tactical fighter airframe that was one third lighter but two thirds cheaper at the hundredth copy than the 72% metal base design. That was too radical, so Dave quit. One bounce later, 20 years ago, I hired him to lead the complete virtual design with two tier one auto engineering firms in Europe of something I'd invented nine years earlier called a hypercar, a carbon fiber mid sized hybrid electric SUV. So we designed this 20 years ago with a couple of European tier ones and its airframe inspired body suspended from rings not built up from a tub had just 14 parts, each made with one low pressure die set saving 95 to 99% of the tooling cost. Each part can be lifted in one or two hands with no hoist. In fact, the biggest part here on the side, uh, I can briefly lift with one finger. The parts then snap precisely together uh, for bonding, self-fixturing and detolerance in two dimensions, so you don't need the robotic body shop. Laying color in the mold can eliminate the paint shop. There go the two hardest and costliest steps in automaking, saving about 80% of manufacturing capital. So that plus the two-thirds smaller powertrain pays for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting approximately free. Now, Seven years after we designed that SUV, Toyota designed this 70% lighter carbon fiber plug-in hybrid sedan, concept car. So it's as big outs outside, uh, sorry, it's as big inside as a Prius, but it, it has half the fuel use and a third the weight. Uh, then 2013 brought to market this profitable quadruple deficiency carbon fiber electric car I'll describe in a moment plus another maker's 0.9 liter per 100 kilometer two-seater, and then even a one ton lighter aluminum fleet band in the lower left, like this hybrid we developed and road tested 11 years ago, could save a fifth of US light vehicle fuel at lower life cycle costs with no subsidy. And carbon fiber autos can actually save much more oil than Saudi Arabia lifts, but with simpler designs, they can be made at normal cost. How do we know that? Well, because BMW did it starting seven years ago with this carbon fiber electric car that I drive. This i3 reportedly made money from the first unit off the assembly line. And Sandy Monroe, the normally understated US master of automotive costing called it the most significant vehicle since Ford's Model T and the most advanced vehicle on the planet. It validated our 1990s claims you heard a moment ago because its carbon fiber is paid for by the batteries that its lightness saves. And fewer batteries mean faster recharging. Also, of course, less recharging infrastructure investment. The integrative design decompounds mass far more than is usually assumed. The manufacturing is radically frugal, confirming the elimination of the conventional body and paint shops and it's much better for workers. 
and overlooked synergies between ultralight materials and electric traction quadruple the efficiency without compromise and with many driver advantages. No wonder BMW has just extended this model's life four years beyond the normal span. Now an RMI spinoff developed an even faster manufacturing process and sold it to a tier one press maker. Here's the four-year-old version that can make a complex variable thickness, optionally anisotropic, overmoldable two by two meter carbon fiber part in one minute. And it could become several fold faster still. There are at least 16 rival processes, including 3D printing of whole carbon fiber cars, but let the competition roll. And such radical vehicle fitness enables all kinds of advanced powertrain. Our SUV's two thirds lower tractive load made its hydrogen tanks two thirds smaller for the same range, uh, 530 kilometers in this case. So 1990s off the shelf tanks at only 345 bar pressure, 5,000 PSI, uh, that, uh, those, those tanks were small enough to package to fit conveniently. And the fuel cell, the little bit down at the right here with the X on it, uh, that also became three times smaller. So you could pay three times more per kilowatt and at a standard 80% experience curve, you would then need about 32% less cumulative production volume to reach competitive cost. You could do it at Australian volumes. And that speeds the hydrogen transition by a decade or two. Now to make a car half to two thirds lighter, you have to go repeatedly around the uh, design spiral or design cycle. First, you make the auto light and slippery to cut its tractive load by at least half. And that allows smaller and more advanced powertrain and smaller, lighter chassis components. Uh, and that leaves more packaging space for comfort and more crush space for safety. That's good because you're on the road with heavy things. Next, as you keep going around the spiral, you make components smaller as their structural loads shrink because the less weight you have, the less weight you need. Lightness begets lightness. And many big parts then disappear. A good series hybrid that becomes quickly attractive in this approach can eliminate, let's see, transmission, clutch, flywheel, drive shaft, U joints, axles, differentials, starter, alternator. Each of those nine eliminations saves even more weight. Then you go around the spiral some more. And at first, it might seem that the special materials and powertrain and design might uh, raise manufacturing cost. But after more snowballing of weight savings, uh, you need so much carbon fiber and powertrain less than you did before. You need so little of it. <coughs> and the manufacturing as BMW showed in these advanced composite structures can get so much simpler that those two savings pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultra lighting roughly free. Now designing our uncompromised four to six fold more efficient carbon fiber electric SUV 20 years ago also required us to organize the designers differently. Uh, and this is another thing <coughs> that Dave Taggart brought from the Skunk Works. The basic design used not a thousand plus engineers, but seven all around the same table and collectively responsible for dauntingly ambitious whole vehicle requirements that the industry had no idea how to meet. Each engineer was responsible for one major vehicle system or function as well. But for those, here's the trick, we deliberately wrote no requirements because we didn't want him to make his problem into her problem. We wanted to make the whole team design a highly integrated vehicle together around the same table. So two engineers were not comfortable without their very own requirements. So we replaced them in the first fortnight. Then it went great. And we got the desired result. Toyota asked how we did it. We told them and out came their 70% lighter 1X concept car that you saw earlier. Now, you also have to design in the future, not in the past. When the Soviet Union shot down Francis Gary Powers' U-2 spy plane in 1960, Kelly Johnson, who led the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, did not say, I'm going to design a slightly better U-2. He said, I want to own the skies for decades. So we'll design a Blackbird, SR-71. I don't know how, but we'll figure out. So they did, it took about 13 months. You see, Johnson understood that such an airplane was impossible within the conventional design context. 
he knew the design is like a rubber band, elastic band. If you try to stretch it too far from the conventional design space, you encounter more and more resistance <coughs> and eventually it breaks. But if you jump instead to the new design space that you aspire to, then you can stretch the rubber band back as far as needed for technologies that aren't yet ripe. And as they mature, the rubber band relaxes to where you want to be. Now these auto examples reveal a big policy lesson. And I apologize for the uh, eye chart, but I think if I construct it bit by bit, it'll make sense. I have the extra retail price, sticker price of a new car on the vertical axis, all in constant dollars. I have the rated, uh, so it's the increase in sticker price. And then I have the rated fuel efficiency on the horizontal axis. The US National Research Council publishes from time to time estimates of a technology by technology uh, <coughs> approach <coughs> that underlies US and global efficiency policies for autos. And this shows in 2001 or two, their low and high estimates of potential uh, fuel savings in light trucks and cars about 15 years ahead. Then in dark blue, the same estimates they did in 2015, they're working on the next set now. And those caught up with previously rejected independent analyses. But these official forecasts were all soon embarrassed by actual market platforms that came on the market months to weeks later, uh, like these from Honda, burning gasoline, uh, Toyota, the hybrid Prius, BMW, the EV, I, electric vehicle I talked about, also by major automakers, light metal, gasoline engine, virtual design in collaboration with RMI, and by Porsche engineering, uh, virtual design for the steel industry using high strength steel with either a petrol engine or RMI's estimate for a hybrid variant. So in 2004, we then adapted the base vehicles an analysis we did for the Pentagon called Winning the Oil Endgame. Uh, and we then uh, figured out the typical light truck and car values uh, if, if those were either internal combustion or hybrid. So there's about 15 real or virtual designs. Uh, and just to complete that set, here's the aluminum commercial fleet van I showed you earlier, uh, conservatively recosted to today. Now, NRC's component-based analysis is obviously missing the right hand two thirds or so of the design space. That is highly integrative whole vehicle design can at least treble and at lower cost the fuel savings that policymakers now expect and analyzing auto efficiency by the part, not by the car, thus makes efficiency look several fold smaller and costlier than whole vehicle design integration can achieve. Therefore, current efficiency standards are a lot more conservative than anyone thought, and electrification can be far cheaper and faster than today's heavy high drag platforms are yet exploiting. And imagine what we could do if we were as good designers as nature is as Paul McCready taught us by diagramming some design features of a California condor. Besides the lovely aerodynamic features, I particularly like the fully integrated system and the advanced manufacturing techniques. These examples from buildings and autos can help us cultivate beginner's mind and radical efficiency in industry, which uses half the world's energy and electricity. So my team's latest 50 odd billion dollars US worth of industrial integrative designs have typically found 30 to 60% retrofit energy savings paying back in a few years. And in new builds about 40 to 90 odd percent energy savings with generally lower than normal capital cost. This is far better than the place energy service companies normally deliver this round blob uh, and here's the best ESCO I know, it happens to be in Ireland. Um, our better results, all the rest of the dots, come from rethinking industrial processes and from redesigning basic elements like pump fan and motor systems. 
let's go to there for a bit. For example, in both buildings and industry, special industry, better pipe and duct design can save about 80 to 90 odd percent of friction. And if everyone did it, this could save roughly half the world's coal-fired electricity, typically paying back in less than a year in industrial retrofits and instantly in new builds. Just as my house paid up front for its super insulation by eliminating the heating system, so fatter pipes and ducts more than repay any higher first cost by shrinking the pumps, fans, motors, and power supplies. The methods are simple, two steps. First, you use big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. In fact, the blue pump you see on the right in this picture looks so small you'd think somebody slipped a decimal point, but it's all you need when you make the pipe fat enough. Uh, and secondly, you lay out the pipes first, then the equipment. So you can see this row of three chillers, instead of being neatly aligned, has been staggered laying out the pipes first so all the right angle elbows have been eliminated and the uh, fluid can flow with very little friction. Now, such rearrangement of designers' metal furniture can spread at the speed of Twitter. I mean, now that you've seen these diagrams, you know how to do it. You can go do it tomorrow. And yet it remains largely unnoticed and unpracticed. It's only in one engineering textbook in the world as far as I know. That's, that was done in 2008 and 9 in Australia, thank you, called Whole System Design and Integrated Approach to Sustainable Engineering by Stasinopoulos, Smith, Hargroves, and Desha. Uh, and it's now on Google Books. And as far as I know, this approach is not taught in any engineering school. I hope you will correct me on that. It's not in any government study or industry forecast or climate model. Why not? Because it's not a bloody technology. It's a design method. And yet few people think of design as a scaling vector, a way to make things big fast. Now let's dig a little more into these two steps. Two changes in the design process. First, specking small pipes, uh, sorry, big pipes and small pumps, not small pipes and big pumps. Now you'll recall that friction in a pipe falls as about the fifth power of its diameter. So how fat should the pipe be to optimize the friction? Well, the textbooks say to make the pipe just as fat as will repay its extra cost over the years from the saved pumping energy. But that's wrong because it leaves out the capital cost of the pumping equipment. When we triple the normal insulation in my house, we weren't trying to save <clears throat> only energy, but also the capital cost of the heating equipment, right? So, if we had stopped at the point where adding more insulation wouldn't save enough energy to pay for itself, we would need furnace, ducts, fans, pipes, pumps, wires, controls, fuel supply arrangements. But we eliminated all that lot. All that kit went away when we used three times more insulation and the total capital cost was less. So the operating savings were uh, just straight off the top. Now, Obviously, in a pumping system, the pump and motor and inverters and electricals have to be big enough to overcome the friction. So their size and roughly their capital cost will go down as roughly the fifth power of pipe diameter. But the capital cost of the fatter pipe goes up is only about the second power of diameter. So when we optimize the pipe as a component, we're pessimizing the system. Instead, optimizing the entire system at once yields fat pipes tiny little pumps and motors, and the total capital cost goes down. Now the second shift in design is simpler and therefore harder. We lay out the pipes first, then the equipment, not the reverse. Now traditionally, it's the opposite. We put the tanks, boilers, or whatever in convenient, arbitrary, traditional places, and then ask the pipe fitter to please come connect point A to point B. But by then, A and B are far apart. Other stuff got in between. They're at the wrong height, they face the wrong direction. And by the time the pipe snakes at neat right angles as they teach us in trade school across the whole space, it has about three, to three to six times the friction that it would have had with a straight shot. The pipe fitters think this is great. You pay them by the hour, they mark up the extra pipes and fittings, and they're not paying for your bigger pumping system or your bigger electric bills forever. But for you as owner, it's smarter to have fat, short, straight pipes 
rather than thin, long, crooked pipes. In a Dutch industrial pumping loop case, this approach actually cut pumping energy by a factor of seven to 12 with lower capex. And as a free bonus, it also saved 70 kilowatts of heat loss with a two month payback because it's short straight pipes are easier to insulate than long crooked pipes. But belatedly then, I realized that we had left out eight additional benefits that we could have captured, each justifying even bigger savings. And I later estimated that had we properly counted and valued these extra benefits, we would have saved not 86 to 92% of the pumping energy as we did, but probably nearer 98%, and the capex would have been even lower. In fact, adding some piping in my own house some years ago, we recently saved about 97% of the friction and pumping power by this approach. And the design changes we need are so simple, you can grasp them instantly. Like in practically every building and factory, a critical pump with an in-place spare pump is laid out like this. So the flow always goes through two right angle bends. A lot of friction. Why not lay it out like this? So the main flow has no bends and also fewer valves. And the same logic applies with identical pumps in tandem, a very common arrangement. So in California's Oakland Museum, our colleague Peter Rumsey, uh, he and I are disciples of Mr. Lee, retrofitted an efficient piping layout into the condenser water pumping loop, cutting the pumping energy by three fourths with a two or three month payback and eliminating 15 pumps that will never again waste energy and maintenance costs. Then he also repiped the chilled water loop and added variable frequency drives. Notice these things are laid out at funny angles. He doubled the flow and he saved 85% of the energy. He simply asked the pipe fitters to lay out the supply pipes as if they were drains because the pipe fitters in another part of their brain know that if drains have elbows, they'll clog because they're only driven by gravity. Here's how most pump built buildings pipe cooling tower water back to the condenser. But if we lay it out instead the way Peter does, everything gets better. The only obstacle is force of habit. We should bend mines, not pipes. What does such savings mean for the pumps and fans that use half the torque of the motors that use over half the world's electricity? Well, from the fuel burns in the power plant to the end use, there are so many compounding losses that only about a tenth of the energy in the fuel comes out the pipe as flow. But now turn those compounding losses round backwards by saving a unit of say half of the flow or friction in the pipe and it multiplies back to save 10 units, 10 times as much of fuel cost emissions and global weirding back at the power plant. And as you go back upstream, the components get smaller and cheaper, so the total capital cost goes down. Now, whilst you're making the pumps and fans and motors about five or 10 times smaller, you can also do 34 other things to the motor systems and collectively then save about three to five times more energy than just the usual two improvements, that is higher efficiency motors and adjustable speed drives. And by the way, the cost per saved kilowatt hour will go down by a factor five, because if you do the right seven improvements first, you get 28 more as free byproducts. This is all based on a 1989 uh, Gaythick analysis we did, uh, and it examined induction or asynchronous motors in red, synchronous in yellow, DC in green. And our system boundary was from the electric meter to the input shaft of the driven machine. So we did count efficiency upstream in the wires and controls in the motor itself, in a mechanical torque transmission to the load, but we did not count better, for example, pumps or uh, pipes or uses. Uh, nonetheless, altogether in the motor, the drive system, we could cumulatively save nearly half the total 1986 drive power energy in the U.S. as shown in blue with paybacks typically under a year at a five UN set tariff per kilowatt hour. This matches what the utilities came up with at EPRI. It's twice what IEA thinks you can save. I think they've left out a lot and it's a lot cheaper than what they think you can save. At a third of a century, uh, I'll be the first to say this analysis merits updating and let's see what the numbers really are now. Uh, a lot of the technologies have got better even as we used up a lot of the potential. So let's see what it adds up to now. 
And if a tenfold pumping saving sounds to you incredible, just consider that at this moment, your heart is pumping blood about 10 times as efficiently as typical industrial pumping systems move water and other liquids. Apologies for the US barbaric units. If your 100,000 or so kilometers of fractal blood vessels in your body had the design and friction of standard industrial piping, you would need a heart bigger than your body. That's very inconvenient. But in fact, your heart's only about a third of a kilogram, one and a half watts, and it's sufficient because your blood follows nature's standard design, which is called laminar vortex flow, uh, as explicated by an Aussie friend of mine, uh, Pax Scientific's uh, CEO and sea captain, uh, Jay Harmon, in a wonderful book called The Shark's Paintbrush. Uh, and he's developed a new kind of hydrodynamics displacing centuries of supposedly mature practice. Now, he's a keen observer of shapes in nature and why things are the shape they are, like Darcy Thompson used to be. So he noticed at the upper left, this ropey Fibonacci spiral <coughs> in vortices, like water draining out the bathtub. And he froze such a whirlpool in acrylic, realized it must be the minimum energy shape for the air-water surface, and then brilliantly inferred that perhaps a, a rotor with that shape might move fluids with minimum energy. And then he did so in fan and pump designs. So the rotor at the lower right, the pump rotor, actually emulates the water vortex at the upper left, and it's tens of percentage points more efficient. Now, a growing family of such products can often improve pump and fan efficiency by 20 or 30 percentage points without quite violating the pump and fan equations. It has many other applications we've barely begun to imagine. One of the most fun ones, uh, a successful early use that now has most of the market, is in the big tanks that hold purified municipal water before the water work sends the water out for use. And that water has to be kept circulating to keep the disinfectant active. Normally that needs a giant rotor like the one on the left driven by hundreds of kilowatts. So in the center photo, you see an Australian uh, ex-intern of mine, Otto Kodman, who is now selling these machines all over uh, with a fist size version driven by a 25 to 50 watt motor. And it outperforms the one on the left by setting up ring vortices you see at the upper right that require almost no energy to keep going. And since those biomimetic rotors performance does not depend on scale or on Reynolds number, wow, <laughs> there's even more than we thought to be saved in the roughly 25 or 30% of global electricity that runs pumps and fans. So modern pumps and fans are marvels of Victorian technology, but learning from 3.8 billion years of design experience out the window can teach us even better how things are made, how they work, how they fit. So start with biomimicry.net.org uh, and .com, uh, the amazing assemblage of stuff by uh, our friend Janine Benyus and, and her team, and a w website called Ask Nature, I believe it's .org, where you enter your design problem, it tells you which organisms have solved it, the literature on how they solved it, and who in industry is emulating how they solved it. One last example here, similar logic actually applies to big data centers. Two thirds of the fuel fed into the power plant is lost in the plant and the grid. Half the metered electricity is then lost in the cooling system and the uninterruptible power supply that together amount to half the capex of the data center. And that's before the electricity reaches the servers, but then half the energy fed to the servers doesn't get to the chips because it's lost in inefficient, usually very underloaded power supplies and in lots of fans to take heat that largely shouldn't be there off the motherboard into the room so we could do dumb things with it. Then the next pro pro problem is severe underutilization of computing resources, partly through insufficient virtualization. And the resulting energy flow is so small it's about to vanish, so let's magnify it. The next uh, step is bloatware running many unnecessary threads and processes and making simple tasks very complex because CPU cycles were cheaper than programmers attention and someone else was buying the energy. Downstream of all that you might even have inefficient business processes. In all you multiply, do the math and about a few hundred thousandths of the original fuel energy is actually delivering customer value. 
out to be sure this is using 10 year old designs, but there are still a lot of them out there. Where should we start fixing this? Well, downstream, start at the end. First write elegantly terse code, optimally compiled with the goal that every compute cycle is a needed and wanted one. I had assumed by the way, 10 years ago that this would save an order of magnitude in compute cycles. Then recent tests suggested it's two orders of magnitude and there was just an article weeks ago in Science Magazine saying it could be bigger than that. And now this shift to mobile devices makes this valuable because efficient code stretches battery life. Okay, next step, at least quadruple server efficiency. Now you can do even more than that. And the servers will also need a great deal less cooling and power supply, <coughs> both of which can be done in smarter ways. And we can even save half the utility losses by using fuel cell tri-generation cheaper than the uninterruptible power supply it displaces. Now multiply those savings from downstream to upstream and you get at least two orders of magnitude energy savings, probably three, maybe more, depending on the software. So in the actual installation for which we made this diagram in a charrette, the client rejected most of our recommendations. So we were only able to triple efficiency at the same capital cost. But our partner EDS said that had the client adopted all the recommendations that EDS and we have thought should be done, the client would have saved about 95% of the total energy and half the capital cost. And that's before big software savings. Oh, I have one more last example. Integrative design can also transform energy supply technologies. So Rocky Mountain Institute had for some years a SHINE program, S-H-I-N-E, which wrung out half the photovoltaic balance of system cost, which was then 60 to 90% of total cost. And that enabled uh, Department of Energy's Sunshot program. And then Shine led two more rounds of whole system redesign with industry. And the third round uh, completed a year or two ago, yielded a two by eight module solar packet or solar Lego block design it's a highly integrated industrial product with 98% fewer parts, 10% less land use, all optimized for shipping, materials, civil works, electric and mechanic insula mechanical insulation, and wind loads. So this could optimize a lot of benefits across the value chain and match or beat wholesale power prices without needing transmission lines as it connects directly into the community's distribution system. It's at a community scale, a tenth to a few megawatts ground mount, and it can feed roughly two and a half US cent a kilowatt hour unsubsidized power straight into the wires. That is below Sunshot's 2030 target of three cents. And now you can buy rather similar equipment, I understand, in Australia. Congratulations, uh, go for it. Why don't you sell some to us? In summary, we're all used to looking for big industrial savings in these familiar eight places. And that's a good menu to start with, but I would encourage you also to apply eight simple methods and priorities, which I've been illustrating for the past hour. This is a kind of synthesis of how the sequence works and it has a lot of important benefits, including, of course, recalling the fun that made many of you get into engineering or architecture in the first place. So if anything that I've said has surprised you, just remember Marshall McLuhan's remark that only puny secrets need protection big discoveries are protected by public incredulity. And I thank you for your good work and your kind and prolonged attention. Let's see what's on your minds. Wow, Amory, thank you so much. Uh, you had radical in the title and you delivered radical. I think uh, there's a few things there that have blown a few minds. Um, so thank you so much, absolutely delivered. Okay, the fuses are replaceable. <laughs> may take us a little bit to catch up with it and process it, but this is great. The, uh, you know, a few things that really popped in and blew my mind a little bit, uh, pumps first and then, and then equipment. I mean, this is, uh, yeah, 
that takes a while for, for that one to sink in, that sort of concept. We've got some comments there saying that uh, uh, the idea of uh, fat pipes and small pumps, maybe that is around in, in some of our industries and, and some of that's through there, but uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not everywhere. Well, I, I would love to know of examples. If you know of people mm. who have done this, please send me photographs and measured data, especially before and after if possible. Yes. Uh, because I love cases. I'm very empirical as you may have gathered and I want to spread your best practice to the rest of the world to the extent you're willing. Absolutely, and I think we've got a few, we'll get through to the, uh, the questions there. We've got a few people that are doing this now, so we'll hear from them. Um, a few other takeaways. I mean, we're talking about doubling energy productivity and then you start thinking, mm, are we being too conservative with doubling? When when you start talking about, uh, you know, that sort of five or six fold improvement in, uh, in HVAC efficiency going down to less than sort of 50 kilowatt hours per square meter, it just almost seems impossible. It's really hard to get your head around that. As engineers, we often think, you know, another 10% or 20%, and then that's that's time to, to pat yourself on the back. But the idea of going that far, this... this uh... on, on that very point, let me just point out that if, for example, you're adding more insulation to a house like mine, mm. the marginal cost of saving heat will go up geometrically. That's mm. how insulation works, it's engineering physics. But when you get to the point where you no longer need the heating system or the cooling system, as the case may be, the cost comes down again off to less than you started with. Mm -hmm. So what I've described the past hour is how you tunnel through the cost barrier. You don't need to get there the long way round if yeah. you ask the right design question up front, like, is there a sensible way to design this building without mechanicals? And once you come with that, yeah, you're if coming you get stuck in the incremental part, it looks costlier. Don't stop there, tunnel. Mm. And, and this is a completely new way of thinking and, and it comes down to even just sizing of pumps uh, instead of putting fat on top of fat on, you know, on top of gas. Uh, I'm getting... It starts with the pipes and, in, and even before mm. that with how much flow do you really need? Obviously, mm. if you don't need to cool the building, you don't need to pump chiller, chill and condensing water around. Very good. I'll, I'll get to some questions in a moment. I'm just going to ask what am I first uh, there. You, you asked for advice on how to make this common this sort of concept. And I, I can only uh, see a few industries that I've dealt with in, in, in my many years of engineering. Uh, one of them that I know does very well with energy productivity, energy efficiency is actually the vegetable oil processing industry. Hmm. It's one of the few industries that when, when the, a, a new plant is built, the, the energy emissions or the emissions intensity the, or the, the specific energy consumption is built into the contracts, hmm. a, a performance guarantee contracts. You will deliver wow. you know, X kilowatt hours per, per litre of oil produced. And, and that's one of the few industries where I see that that's, that's where there, it's, these radical improvements aren't so easily because it's already built in right from the start. But do you think they've already done everything I described? Not everything. If not, they've got the ideal metric for forcing it lower. It's still thinking of five or ten percent improvements. Um, are you aware of other industries that are embracing this and, and really and really going and moving with it? And and, and well, we've yeah, we we have pretty well uh, raised the bar quite abruptly in data centers mm. and in uh, chip fabs. Uh, and that was a really tough one because we had to slip through the invisible crack between two conditions, one where the industry's booming, everybody's, you know, hair on fire trying to get the next chip out before the other guy uh, mm. trying to get the fab built and up. And the other condition is industries in a slump, everybody's beach. That's when the engineer should be designing next fab or fab after next when they're idle, but instead the managers typically furlough people and say, well, we'll call them back and design something with you, you know, when business picks up, but then they're back in condition one. And it, it took uh, about 15 years to find the opening to get through that crack. And the result, you might want to look it up, is Texas Instruments, our, our fab, <clears throat> which, um, 
save most of the energy and water and a lot of other stuff, and 30% of the CapEx, 230 million US dollars cheaper to build. So that's why it was built in Texas, not China. And then applied materials, AMAT, which makes the tools for chip making, uh, asked me to go keynote the big Semicon conference in, in Shanghai to tell the Asian makers what we did at Texas Instruments and TI, bless them, bravely and boldly said, yes, go do it. We'll compete on other stuff. This is like when Volvo invented anti-lock brakes. They shared it with the whole industry because it's good for everybody and they'll compete in other ways. So this practice is starting to spread now. Mm. We're, we're having some luck in some parts of the chemical industry, some in mining, uh, a lot in buildings. I mean, basically I described passive building practice and net zero or net, net positive building efficient levels of efficiency. And you'll notice that from the IPCC data, the savings are a lot cheaper than most people think. So even as supply gets ridiculously cheap, that doesn't mean you should forget about efficiency. Quite the contrary, they're still natural partners and uh, you'll still save money by buying lots of both. Where I think we're stuck at the moment and really need your help is in helping designers and people who commission design done, who write briefs, who write business requirements, to realize that what you can do with net zero or net positive buildings and passive design there, you can also do in vehicles and in industry. I think most people don't yet realize what's possible there, and that's why I showed you a lot of data. Agreed. I think that's uh, this, the idea of how far you can push this is not, not widely adopted and accepted. And, and maybe that leads into our, our next question. Uh, we've got Tim and Humphreys uh, ask the question, of, uh, do you have any real life examples of really efficient hospitals? Some of my colleagues like Alexis Karolidis, who is a staff architect and our mind now working with Peter Rumsey, uh, have worked on hospitals, new and retrofit. And I've seen, I believe, and I'll have to check the numbers, savings in the one third to two thirds range. Uh, but if you were doing it new, it would be a lot easier. Uh, let me add there, especially in the COVID context, um, I was astounded to find that at least in the US, laminar flow like you would have in a clean room uh, is standard practice only in, uh, I believe it's orthopedic and neurological operating theaters, but not in others. If so, that's appalling. Of course we have infections. If we're using turbulent induction to mix clean air with dirty air, as if it were an office and it's stupid to do in an office. We should use displacement ventilation and laminar flow. And I would like to get the CDC people who keep raising the air changes per hour requirements for hospitals in the same room with people from the chemical and semiconductor and similar industries we work with that are dramatically cutting their ventilation requirements and getting better control of airborne contaminants, whether it's dust in a chip fab or loose molecules in a chemical works, it has the same physics as a pathogen floating around in the air. And I'd like to know the rational connection between the infection control outcome you want and higher air changes per hour. I think that's not the right way to go. And learning from these other sectors, we could radically reduce the financial, physical and energy footprints of new healthcare facilities and get better infection control. Yeah, absolutely. All over, all, all patient care areas and not only ORs. And then uh, getting back to the, uh, the ducts and the pipe diameter, there's a question here from a uh, comment from Alastair Sproul uh, saying that uh, fully agree that uh, ducts and pipe diameters uh, teach this approach in an energy efficiency course at School of uh, PV and RE Engineering at University of New South Wales. So great to hear that's uh, one uni uh, working on that one. Um, how, else, let put, how Let me just interrupt a minute and put in a plug. 
if any of you are teaching courses with material akin to what I've been talking about, please write me, amory mm -hmm. at rmi.org. Uh, I would love to be in touch with you. We are trying to figure out how to spread this pedagogy. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to share our materials and learn from yours. Absolutely, let's do that. The question though is, uh, you know, they get the response from industry is that they are losing floor, floor space, space, therefore uh, net leasable area. Uh, they're, so they're what? Here, Say again. thoughts on this uh, apparent, oh, they're, they're losing, the, the, the industry is pushing back saying that they're losing uh, net leasable area with this approach of, of the beer ducks and what have you. Uh, oh, you get it. You get yes. it. You do displacement ventilation. Uh, you, you lose a lot of vertical height. I, uh, floor to floor, which saves a, an expensive strip of facade and around mm -hmm. the building and, and a lot of structure to hold up more weight. Uh, and the you don't have big mechanical rooms. You, you don't have big vertical duct sections. Uh, somebody's not designing or computing quite right if they're finding a drop in net rentable space. It actually improves by typically three to six percentage points with, with optimal design. Absolutely. If they follow that process, then yes, that uh, the mechanical room should be shrinking by a lot, and therefore that's that's making up for the difference. And, uh, or go away. I, I have a room in our our new uh, innovation center down the road, which I dubbed the Nega Mechanicals Room. Mm. It was supposed to be 25 square meters of uh, chillers and boilers or furnaces, and we designed them all out and took the space back. Mm. I want to sneak in on a dark night with a roll of yellow industrial tape and outline on the floor like bodies at a crime scene where that equipment was supposed to be till we got rid of it. Awesome. Another question here we got from Luke Menzel. Uh, Amory, your reference to beginner's mind is really intriguing. Uh, profoundly innovative design solutions are possible if we let go of preconceptions. Do you think our current crisis Oh, sorry, can't hear. I'll try and talk a bit closer. A bit. Yeah, talking about a beginner's mind, the saying is really intriguing, and uh, a profoundly innovative design solutions are possible if we let go of preconceptions. I think the current crisis, obviously relating to COVID, is an opportunity to reset and and come to our big energy and climate challenges with a fresh perspective. Can this be a catalyst for change? Yes, indeed. In fact, I, I have a paper out for peer review at the moment on whether a virus and viral ideas can uh, speed our journey beyond fossil fuel. Um, I would suggest you take a look at carbontracker.org's new paper called Decline and Fall on uh, how likely it is that by the time the world's energy demand recovers, if it does, from where it was, say, last year, uh, renewables will have grown so much that they'll take more than all the growth. So peak fossil fuel and peak oil may well have had, uh, be, be in the rearview mirror. They may have happened last year. And when that happens, capital markets flee the incumbents and put their money into the insurgents. It's quite an exciting time. Absolutely. Of course, this is particularly fun if viral ideas, like the ones I showed you on pipe layout, can spread quickly, much as we're now used to scaling solar and wind power uh, manufacturing quickly, well, maybe viral ideas can be fast too. There's no literature to say, but social media certainly seem to have that potential. Yeah, and if it had peak coal, I think it was 2014, so 2013, yeah. 2013, thank you. I think uh, and peak, have... peak car, at least for internal combustion engines, maybe for all cars, was 2017. And peak fossil fueled electric generation in the world was 2018. So we're passing a lot of nice milestones. Great to have these plotted out. The, uh, we've got another question here from uh, Ben. And uh, he said uh, someone is involved in mechanical service contracting. One of the biggest barriers I've seen is that the first time the installer sees the design is when the request for tender documents are received. 
if the contractor offers ideas for improved uh, efficiency in design, the designer sees it as a challenge to his authority. We've seen that one too. Uh, they are the ones getting paid to do the design. If the humble contractor offers the ideas, uh, they feel their authority expertise is being undermined. Uh, mm. The builder has little interest in energy efficiency as there is no commercial incentive for, for them to deliver an energy efficient design. Uh, furthermore, by the time the request for tender is received, there is always time pressure on the builder. That means they have little interest in energy saving opportunities. Uh, it seems there is an inherent problem in the structure of the way the building contracting system works. Uh, do you have any suggestions of how this can be overcome? This, this is uh, through can you say whether buildings everywhere. And is this public and private sector uh, tenders? This would be, this is just the way it always, always, always works. Um, well, let me suggest perhaps with some of your sensible state governments uh, or even with urban governments, you might start uh, by suggesting performance-based fees for hmm. the design professionals. Uh, this will tell you which designers are willing to stand behind high performance design that simplifies your selection of the best designers and they will want to distinguish themselves in a crowded market uh, by uh, perhaps being compensated on a split basis some up front to keep food on the table but then a shared saving for x years afterwards in fact what I would love to see, this would take collaboration with the tendering authority, uh, is not a transaction, but a relationship where you, the designer, the holder of the design intent would offer that after the building is up and commissioned and measured and we've done the shared savings calc, uh, I will continue to improve the building. If you pay me like a Chinese wellness doctor, you pay me a little bit each year uh, as long as it keeps getting better, but if it stops getting better, you stop paying me so that I have an incentive to roll in the best new technology and keep retraining your staff that operate the building. Now, the, the tendering problem you describe, and you could go a lot further into details like do they require stupid stuff like orthogonal pipe layout to make it look pretty, uh, that, that is at the root of the problem, but <clears throat> We, in, in the General Services Administration, the biggest U.S. landlord, which owns the, our equivalent of the Crown Estate, all the, all the federal buildings except the Postal Service and the military, uh, it took only a year <clears throat> to double the retrofit savings they were getting by showing in a demonstration project or two uh, what better performance they could get at lower cost then they rolled that out nationwide, and now they're leading still further advances. So I think, or another example would be what British Columbia Building Corporation did, saving one third and then two thirds of the energy on retrofits. If you can get anywhere in Australia, because everyone knows physics is different down under, uh, if you can get this going in any public authority, the others will have to pay attention Mm -hmm. Or if you can find a really smart private developer, perhaps that you've worked with for a long time and say, we'd like to try something different with you that we think would give much better value. Can we do a joint experiment? And we'll both take some risk in it, but in a fair way. I, I think that that is a very good way, especially if you can get the public and private sectors competing in who gets credit for innovation. Mm -hmm. And we have a little paper uh, on performance-based design fees. We've done five examples of it, both, I think they were mostly or all with public authorities in the state of Texas, uh, not a hotbed of environmentalism or liberal politics. And it worked really well. And what then happens is that when the value engineers come in, to say, oh, you don't need these expensive super windows, I'll get you some cheap spec windows. You know, it's about neither value nor engineering. The designers were able to say, well, yeah, you can do that, but it's like squeezing a balloon. It'll pop out bigger in the mechanical budget mm. and the building's gonna cost more to build. You obviously don't understand our design 
and you weren't at the table when all of us did the charrette and, and uh, really get out of here. <laughs> and they were able to defend their design successfully. Mm -hmm. Is performance based to fees the models for that? Do you have sample commercial contracts that you may be able to share parts of so that we can try and disseminate that? Because you know, that, that may be one. I'll have to ask whether we do. We actually mm -hmm. did one on our own building uh, and uh, actually, we rolled it into a larger and very powerful concept you probably are using, and I hope so, called integrated project delivery. Does that ring a bell? That's, that is a contract. It was written up first in Harvard Business Review mm. for an Autodesk uh, retrofit in Massachusetts. And it's a simple and strong idea, namely the owner, the designers, and the builder uh, all enter a prenuptial agreement that they will be rewarded predictably for common success and penalized predictably for common failure all together. There's none of this yeah, this <laughs> because they all have shared in completely aligned incentives. And by the way, they're also all having the same information at the same time on the same software. So if, for example, our builder has a question for the architect, she's going to get an instant answer because delay hurts the architect's profits too, not just the builders. Yep. So it isn't the usual throw it over the transom uh, operation. It's highly integrated, extraordinarily effective. A lot of outfits use it in the U.S. now, and you can easily roll what amounts to performance-based fees right into that because right. the designers are one of the three big parties. And I certainly see as A2EP's role is to try and really promote those sort of uh, ways of working and, and you've certainly inspired uh, ourselves and I'm sure so many viewers. Yeah, and you could add it as a, as a writer on a triple net lease so you don't need to renegotiate the lease. You could have an Aussie uh, uh, lawyer draft that for you and spread it around. Perfect. And yeah, I'll, I'll send you a reference to the little paper we did uh, that's online about performance-based fees, but I don't think it has standard form contracts. Well, we will put that on the list for the many things to further research and to do after this uh, most inspiring uh, presentation today. Henry. We are at the end of our time and I'm sure people have some other things to do as much as I would love to take only probably another four hours of your time for questions, uh, but, but uh, we, we should close it off. Uh, Amory Lovins, it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us today. We thank you so much for your time and, and your advice and, your, and absolutely your inspiration. Uh, we'll you. take this torch and we will run with it and, uh, and, and we look forward to staying in touch and, and we'll get back to you on, on the, the, uh, the schools and universities that are already following some of these approaches and let's see if we can share back to you and close the loop there for you for where they've been. And the field experience yeah. and anybody yeah. that's near Aspen, come try the bananas. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, and thank you all to our participants and attendees today. And uh, Tony, thanks for organizing this uh, webinar as well once more. Okay, and thank you all. <laughs>